Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are on a session, uh, uh, the second session of today's session of science, engineering, and technology. And uh, we try to give uh, a specific, uh, integrated, and strategic perspective. And we have uh, a fantastic panel, panel of uh, distinguished panelists. But before uh, going to present each one of them, I, I need to, uh, uh, to propagate to more uh, World Academy current ac accomplishments. And I, I just uh, share my screen uh, to, to help, hopefully, somewhere. <laughs> the bottom. Okay, yeah. Green. Screen. Not enough. There's a green button which says share yeah, yeah, but and... I try, I try, it doesn't work. Oh. I think you should be able to. Okay, anyway, uh, 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 the, um, I, I go, I go by word that is, is that is two uh, more current initiative. One is that uh, 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 you know that uh, the World Academy is, is promoting uh, science, engineering, technology uh, um, all, all over the world uh, with uh, uh, a, a specific uh, a point of view uh, focused on humanity. And so we um, um, have uh, two special sessions in uh, the incoming uh, System Man and Cybernetics Conference in Toronto, uh, organized by IEEE. So we have two special sessions, and uh, and then uh, a second accomplishment is that uh, uh, we were invited by MDPI, that is a well-known publishing company on on the on the web for all op open uh, open journals, uh, uh, to uh, deal with the special issues on on, on uh, uh, a, a topic that is quite quite. Uh, uh, focus the, to uh, the academy that is humanity and system science to, towards semiotic autonomous artificial intelligence, and so and, and, and this uh, 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 these special issues is is already started and is open over 12 months, and so uh, uh, we have uh, I think hopefully enough time to prepare a good papers for that special issue. Uh, on the other end, for the uh, IEEE conference, uh, I remember you that the deadline is just at the end of June to submit uh, papers to the special sessions. And so I finish with these uh, recommendations and, uh, and uh, I am ready uh, to introduce uh, our distinguished guests that uh, I start with, uh, 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 let's say, Professor Neboša Neskovic, that is a long time professor at, at University uh, um, uh, of Serbia and, and uh, is a theoretical physicist and secretary general of the World Academy and many other appointments that I would take about uh, uh, half an hour to list all of them. Uh, as for any other, any other panelist that is here. And so uh, uh, I go, I go uh, just short. And then the, the second one is uh, Professor Wittel Kistner, that is uh, a vice president of IEEE Educational Activities uh, and life member, IEEE life member, and I stop here. <laughs> and, then, and then we have a Carol Carter, that is a president and CEO of a global mining organization that I think all of you already know quite well. And then uh, 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 Professor Liliana Trajkovic, uh, that is uh, a professor at Simon Fraser University of Canada and I is IEEE Director Division. And uh, so I really honor it to have a <laughs> career and, and, uh, and uh, IEEE Fellow. And then uh, Robert Cavey, Cavey uh, Partner Praxis uh, Inc. And so uh, uh, now I think we are, we are ready to, to start. And I start with a little introduction that is uh, just to give the tone of, uh, of our talking. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, this time, the coronavirus has not broke 
has not broken our world. It is just exposed a world that was already breaking. The ultimate problem we face today is not coronavirus or deadly pathogen or any other single threat. It is our inability to solve most of the sh shared existential, existential challenges we face. The mental tendency of dividing reality into contrary polar opposites by dichotomization results in a continuous clash between mutual exclusive contradiction that resolve into complementaries at a higher level. Human life cannot be fully understood in terms of generalization of in statistics. We need to take into account the role of conscious individuality in human affairs. Human accomplishment is the product of subconscious sensations, conscious perceptions and forces that are influenced by past events, present perceptions and future possibilities. The reunification of these three dimensions of time into a triple time division will mark an important contribution to the emergence of the new anthropic scientific method. And so we need to build a shift from the classical to the new anthropic scientific method. From the past uh, system view that was uh, just uh, uh, based on, uh, on mechanicistic re reductionist uh, uh, approach, uh, the, the Newtonian approach, that you can divide the system in many different phases. The pieces, uh, you solve all of them, you put uh, back everything together, and uh, you solve the problem. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way with real things. And so we need uh, a, 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 the complex system approach that is uh, the, uh, managed by the anthropic scientific. And so uh, we la I like to analyze this perspective. So asking, for instance, uh, 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 um, which kind of, uh, of uh, um, ideas can you develop to promote uh, this uh, uh, augmented view uh, that, that uh, I know is, is a, a fundamental component of, for education. And we all know quite well that, and we treat that on, on a different panel. But I think that. Uh, if we want to share this uh, new understanding, it's not just a matter of education. It's just a matter of awareness. Uh, to, be sh to be sure that when we talk uh, about uh, a, a system approach, we are talking about the co complex system, system approach and not, and not the old one any longer. And, 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 and this is the, 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 basic, the basic understanding. And uh, just to, to start with the, the right tone, we start from the top and we go to the bottom and, and vice versa, because uh, I like the multi-scale approach to solve problems. I like to start with, with uh, uh, Prof. Uh, Professor Neskovic, because uh, I think that uh, he will have something quite interesting to, to tell us. So Nebosha, please. Thank you. The floor is yours. so sorry. Uh, I was uh, a participant in the, this morning session and I was talking about two global organizations in science and technology, the European Organization for Nuclear Research, well known CERN in Geneva, Switzerland, and the Joint Institute for Nuclear Research in Dubna, Moscow region, Russia. But here, I will talk about another aspect. In the morning, I was talking about the industrial returns of the member states from the two organizations. This will be another topic connected, of course, to, to the whole picture, but the title or the topic will be uh, the integral approach to research, development and production in these two organizations. But uh, before Starting, let me just tell you that these two organizations are considered as the most successful global scientific and technological organizations today uh, and in a long period of time. Currently, CERN has 31 member and associate member states and the Joint Institute has 24 member and associate member states. They are similar but complementary. Each organization collaborates with several hundred research centers and universities worldwide. Uh, the two organizations have, have been successfully demonstrating advancement 
and excellence in science and technology on the global level in more than 60 years. They were founded in the beginning of the 50s. But how should one explain uh, this extraordinary achievement? I think that one of the reasons for the sex is the fact that the two organizations have been applying an integral approach to the research, development, and production chain, to the whole chain, at one place, in one institution. This is the point. Their activities include basic and applied research, high technological innovation and development, and also, very important, equipment construction. I'm repeating that the whole chain is uh, uh, in, in the two organizations. Such an approach enables direct interactions of numerous well-trained researchers and engineers along the whole chain, ensuring efficient and fruitful transfer of new knowledge between them. But the driver of all these activities is basic research. This is very important. That is the exploration of the unknown being, let me emphasize this, an essential human desire and motivation. This is not always emphasized, but this is the point. The basic research in the two organizations. In CERN, it is going on in particle and nuclear physics and in the Joint Institute in particle physics, nuclear physics, condensed matter, and also radiation biology. One of the conclusions one can draw from this successful development is related to, uh, to the states worldwide, concretely to a state having the aim to seriously participate in international and global scientific and technological cooperation. Such a state, having such a name, must have a realistic, of course, realistic, rational, but also well-defined strategy of research and development covering, this is my point, the whole research, development, and production chain, starting with basic research <coughs> and finishing with equipment construction. The whole chain must be included. This is the point of my comment. Such a strategy should be made on the basis of proposal generated by the scientific community. This is the responsibility of the scientific community to launch new ideas, to help the policymakers, the governments create the strategy. And the country also, uh, and that all that must be uh, accompanied with a long-term investment plan. A different approach is a clear sign that the country has no future at all. I'm sure that almost everybody will accept this conclusion with no complaint. But unfortunately, the practice shows the opposite in a number of developing states, including Serbia, the country I'm coming from. This has been all I wanted to say, and I'm, of course, open for questions and discussion. This is a sensitive question. I guess you all understand that, but uh, my experience in a long period of time is, as I have said, pretty bad on, on the subject. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you, Deboja, because uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, we have to stress that uh, uh, collective intelligence and collaborative innovation examples uh, are needed uh, just to, to go further. And uh, I think that uh, the, the, um, the reality that you illustrate uh, right now is just uh, a, one of the top examples of, the, of, of one of those attempts to, uh, to achieve that, that kind of level. And uh, especially one uh, interesting because uh, in at, at that reality, you need science, you need engineering, and you need technology coupled together to achieve uh, the final goal. And so, in a sense, uh, I, you remember our, our talk about heart. Uh, well, I can say that science uh, uh, can be taught as a mental art, engineering as an, apply, an applied art, and technology as a social art. I agree. I agree. I agree. Thank you. All together. Thank you. So now we are ready to hear from 
uh, with all Kisner. I, I think that it's better I call you just by name uh, because uh, at the academy, we, we, that's the, the usual approach. We just uh, to, to save uh, time and uh, feel more friends, uh, uh, friendship together. With all, please. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Quite well. Okay. Um, would you allow me to share a few slides too? Yes, please. Okay, so um, I think that I agree with Nebojša very much uh, that, and uh, Rodolfo, yeah, that the approach... Can you start the sharing, please? We don't see the PPT. Uh, not, not yet, just uh, the preamble. Um, so it is, I agree with everybody because simply the um, system approach is needed. Um, and as you recall from the preamble to the constitution of UNESCO, um, they said very beautifully that since all wars start in the minds of people, we ought to develop peace in the minds of people. Uh, that process uh, will not be done mechanistically. We have to ha first have an argument to do so. And from my perspective, education is a very important component in that process. Um, in order to... Uh, uh, to to do so. Can you see my uh, slides now? Yes, we do. Um, in order to... Uh, oh, it's not working as ex extend, expand. Okay, now we have it. So in order to reach this goal of, of this specific uh, panel, um, my, my angle to, to it is through education, knowledge, and then um, Rodolfo often mentions wisdom, and you will see how we would really move, move this uh, towards that process. So the old model of education, in order to achieve the goal of UNESCO and all of us, uh, the old model of education of um, craft master and apprentice um, has uh, been replaced with the Prussian model when there is a need to have many workers on assembly line. And the worker was really a part of the assembly line. And if one uh, got sick, had to be replaced with someone that would be able to do it without asking too many questions. Therefore, the standardized curriculum for all, fitting all, um, was developed. And unfortunately, we are still, uh, so many years, 300 years later, we are still uh, embed, embedding, embedded in that uh, philosophy. That system worked before because uh, we uh, had essentially a development of a, of, of a person to fit a, jo a job. That job could be had for a lifetime. And then you could see that the green element is rest. And all of the experience, the tragedy of the system also is that all of the experience that has been gathered is then uh, lost. It is not fed into the system. The problem has changed when we have moved to knowledge and are moving towards wisdom-based economy. Uh, that single job is now replaced um, by many jobs and the uh, sim sim simple stage of transformational understanding of this world in physics, mathematics, engineering, technology has been now replaced also re-educating. Uh, re so the school appears more often and uh, the whole idea over here is that it ought to be lifelong. That green line above it is indicating that specific component. So we, are, we have moved into a continuous process of learning. This is uh, uh, confirmed by um, this diagram that I've developed to show I was interested in the inequality between pay between men and, and women. Uh, that has been to a great extent fixed in this area and we are now following somewhat unified things. But the younger generation will no longer have. So the, um, the job, the tenure on a job is much shorter. That translates into today into many jobs already. 
and the gig economy, uh, where skills are much more important than understanding, um, has been developed. This is compounded by the uh, projected uh, population that will be growing in different parts of the world in equality. So our assumption that everything is nice and dandy is no longer valid either. But the most important is what Bucky Fuller um, articulated. It was known, but articulated very nicely by the knowledge doubling and knowledge half time, life um, or half time. So the Prussian model was when really the, the doubling was very slow. It spanned not only one life, maybe many, but then it started in, in, uh, decreasing and decreasing. And now moving from hundreds of years um, to a lifetime down to months and hours. So this is no longer, uh, our genetic code has not been designed or there's no indication that we would be able to absorb all of it. So we won't even know what is happening completely. Uh, on our own. Consequently, what could be the next steps? And I have two more, th three more slides. One is that uh, we've been doing a lot of work to regain the experience of people who have it and feeding it back into the system. So it won't be lost. It won't, be, won't have to be rediscovered. What should be rediscovered is a wheel that is much better than the others. So it is the closing, I call it a closing of the loop in educational system. Our educational system was clearly open-ended, open loop, as the previous pictures indicated. The next step, as many people, all of us know, is personalization of instruction. Uh, Fred Keller, uh, a number of years together with um, many others, um, uh, in the east of the US disco discovered that personalization can be done, but it was really done in a mechanistic type of way by hand. Um, Joseph Pear and I have developed computer-aided personalized system of instruction around 30 years ago and is now used today. It is with the help of machines, certain things could be done, but there are still many, many things missing. Um, the, there's personalized body of knowledge, the Bach, was already done. As, you, as many of educators know, that body of knowledge is what we normally use to create a discipline and implement the program. And personalized delivery and proctoring was there. Um, and I thought that all of those things were solved two years ago when Oxford, very young people at Oxford professors developed the system and uh, I thought it was now movement in not only into personalization, but also tutoring by the best people from professors from around the globe, no longer from Oxford that would like to do it at Oxford. Um, but after clear evaluation, I realized that they have focused again on body of knowledge, not body of experience. Um, so this <clears throat> had to be replaced. We've developed and proposed uh, cognitive digital twins um, that operate in a, in a beautiful way. Uh, so the, the most primitive one, it would provide personalized body of knowledge, personalized body of experience, but personalized delivery. But then it also moves into other areas where that evolution and the system approach uh, comes into being. And it's being now developed, this is a long-term project, it is being developed at different levels. But then I also realized that this was still a mechanistic approach. It was modeled on uh, the digital twins that exist in industry 4, 4.0. Um, we don't, we are not machines. Um, the systems that are even cognitive at that level must also involve culture. So mimetic issues. And I've also, uh, we have proposed and developed um, and working on mimetic uh, cognitive digital twins that we call symbionts. This is a chance that we might move now into collecting the wisdom and knowledge and body of experience and excite 
the younger generation to be better than we are. In my, the uh, Serbian view was that it is difficult and maybe not possible. I'm eternal believer that minds can change if there is a reason. If um, we can change individually, but what matters is that the two of us have to change together. And then all of us have to change together. And then the parents will also pass that at a time when the discovery is at the most, when the formation is the most. And that, with that hope, I feel that all of us together, we will be able to move into one notch. Um, again, the last picture is this. Yes, uh, when we look at this, this little toddler has to climb. It is a scary experience. But look what he is doing, or she. He wants to move the first step. Today and, and this session and many other sessions in this conference and many other conferences that, that Liliana is organizing too. Um, we know about the steps, but we have to really see that we are not alone in that process, that there are many toddlers, many of us, and will be able to move through those steps um, do we know the future? No. But with doing it together and growing, maybe in the poetic sense, we become then the next step and will be stepped so that the horizon would be a little bit better. Thank you very much then. Thank you. Thank you, Widal, for your uh, wonderful contribution. So, so, so large and deep. I mean, great breath for everybody. And, uh, and uh, uh, but I want to pass immediately to Liliana and then uh, later, uh, uh, sorry, to, uh, to Carol, to Carol, uh, Carol uh, and, and later we, we can have uh, com comments on, uh, more comments on that. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Carol, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Well, first of all, so uh, lovely to meet each of you and looking forward to working with all of you to deliver these major goals that we have. And um, I'll start uh, just by sharing a little bit. I put it in the in the chat as well, but a little bit about Global Minded. And I'll tell you a little bit about um, my background. So I'm probably the only non-engineer on the panel. Uh, I'm the liberal arts major, but I'm married to the electrical engineer who became a product manager uh, for HP and worked in Stuttgart for three years. And so I, I feel like I, I know your world and I'm a big believer that we have to conjoin many different worlds for the collaborations that we meet, need, need to have to move the major levers for access and equity. So my background is I was in corporate America. I used to work for um, Prentice Hall, which I'm sure many of you know, it's a global, global company, then was bought by Pearson. And I was their um, first female assistant vice president when I was 26 and their first female VP at 30. And then I started writing books and really started looking at how we could help young people in college with the kinds of knowledge we have from being young professionals, but we often don't marry those two worlds in ways that those young professionals can launch in their lives. So I think for our, our topic today, what I would you know, very humbly submit is that we need to have more diversity at the table to achieve these major goals. We need to have um, more women involved, you know, more gender diversity, more racial diversity, more people from different backgrounds. And I know we're all dedicated to closing the equity gap, but we know that can't happen when the 1% of the world's wealth goes to the private schools and then goes to Oxford and goes to Cambridge and goes to Harvard and MIT. And you know, we, we have to broaden those circles. So Global Minded is really dedicated to working with those students around the world who are the least resourced but have the most potential to contribute when connected to amazing people like each of you. And when they are not connected to those networks of knowledge, of wealth, of power, then they're not able to join a Fortune 500 company and get promoted by the time that they're 26. 
And um, I, I think that that is something we all have to really realize right now. What are our blind spots and what are the things we've been doing for 50, 60, 70 years that are proving to not get the kind of world that we most want to see? And I think, um, you know, that's something that I can say as an outlier, not as part of the engineering community, our network, and we have a, a very strong STEM community and a technology community equity group within Global Minded. And um, it's been wonderful. Rodolfo was participating with one of them on an event last week. I think we can merge, lane, many of these um, equity groups to move the major levers of access and equity and to really bring opportunity to all of humanity, um, you know, not just one color or the homogenous group or the wealthy group, um, but really democratize all of education globally, which I know is, you know, the goal of you all and Gary and Waz and the UN. Um, so I think that, you know, my hope today is to get to know more what each of you all are doing so I can connect you to our engineering STEM technology equity teams and um, be able to knit together um, those kinds of connections so we can really work with uncommon collaborators to get these major levers moving that we're all capable of when we're working with different kinds of people that are out of the standard lanes that we are typically operating in. So that's what, that's what um, I will say just to start out uh, from Global Minded. And um, we have some wonderful um, engineering folks that were part of a panel yesterday um, in this conference. And then we have some wonderful people, Patty Lopez, who's um, you know, one of the highest ranking Latina PhDs in computer science working at Intel, uh, Toy Massey, who's got a master's in um, nuclear engineering and um, mechanical, and she's a really fabulous African-American leader. Um, uh, Dr. Jonathan Blackwood went to um, MIT undergraduate and then went to medical school. So um, we'll have some of those folks tomorrow, uh, but we have many, many of those kinds of cross-pollinators in our stable that we look forward to um, really introducing and working with you all on those major system changes that we can collectively identify to deliver that. Thank you, thank you, Carol. I think that you just put on the table uh, uh, your interesting perspective that match, uh, uh, matches quite, quite uh, carefully uh, with the, the, the title of our special issues we, uh, we have to develop with M MDPI, that is uh, Humanity and System Science towards symbiotic autonomous artificial intelligence. And so uh, we have to learn a lot, you know, our, our blending different, different uh, components uh, to, to, uh, to achieve the best we can get for the common well-being. Yes, and, and then, to put the humans first. So the technology yeah, is like, facilitating the goodness and the abilities of the humans and not the other way around where it could actually be really separating, you know, the kinds of things we want to see happen. Yeah, but it's up to us. It's up to us. Technology, science, engineering, and technology are just tools. And we have to decide. <laughs> and so now we are ready to hear from Liliana that I, she has so many appointments that in her presentation, I, I forgot one that is the most important one right now because she is even co-chair for the next System Man Cybernetics Conference in Toronto, where, where we have two special sessions. Uh, I mean, the World Academy of Art. So Liliana, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rodolfo. And thank you for inviting me for this uh, session. Uh, it's an unusual conference for me because I usually attend technical conferences where we talk about our research. So I have been trying to figure out uh, uh, what would be interesting to the panel and to the audience. And I thought uh, uh, to remind us all that we live in such uncertain times. And we were never thinking that we are going to be living in 2020 uh, uh, with COVID and all this racial unrest. We always thought it's going to be a much better world. Uh, so there is a lot of work to be done. But uh, COVID uh, reminded us how vulnerable we are as human beings and also revealed a lot of, uh, about interactions between people and between countries. 
uh, and the unrest that uh, we are fa very much facing, not only in North America, but everything else, remind us that people still have to fight for, for equality and for, for justice that should be given to all. Uh, not to be depressing, but to just, uh, I was just uh, preparing for the talk and I was reading the latest version of Cadmus and I looked at the article on global leadership in 21st century that was uh, written by Alexander Likotau. Uh -huh. uh, just to remind us that over 68 million people are now displaced due to conflict and persecution. At least 17 conflicts involve non-state actors and over 150,000 people were killed in 2018. And so we really have to be very optimistic in order to be able to function and be productive in such difficult times. And, uh, you know, these are all things that are very difficult to solve, but we all have to try in order to, to, to bring peace so that we can all function and be very productive. So in those times, I think education is very important and I very much resonate with Vitor's comments. And I also read his paper <laughs> that, uh, uh, about the transformation into a new education paradigm and the role of ecosystem leadership. And since I'm an educator myself, um, I very much resonate with the learning approaches and frameworks that he outlined. So that the knowledge has to be at our fingertips. We all talk about experiment, experiential learning. And uh, in my university, since I teach engineering courses, we very much rely on having tutorials and labs which means that students have to experience uh, 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 the, the, the topics. So it's not very much anymore like a teacher and a student paradigm, but it's very much that students have not to passively sit and listen, but to actively participate in building the systems, in learning through experience. Also collective learning and processes and journeys are very important. Uh, usually in the courses that I teach, we all have, all of us have projects, uh, we work on a teamwork, and I usually remind students that when they get a job, they will not be working alone. So building the team experiences and building not only uh, engineering skills, but communication skills, it's of essence if they are succeed in the outside world. The roles of teachers have changed. And um, those of you who teach probably realize that in the last three months, we have to completely change the way we teach. It's very much online. It's online from home, from kitchen, from bedrooms. And uh, the, the, the same uh, challenges are not only for the teachers and the lecturers, but also for students. So that online education is around to stay uh, in very in different forms. And um, the technology that has to be brought to, to, to work with these kind of platforms are very important. We have all realized that the internet is not ubiquitous, that we currently have students who have trouble connecting to the internet in order to listen to the lectures and the tutorials. And so uh, the whole area of digital and hence pedagog pedagogies are uh, 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 opening up. So the future of education post COVID pandemic is to have affordable education for all. And I very much resonate the Carol that we, do ha we have groups of people who have and who have not. And that's very detrimental for younger generations that cannot afford going, uh, and, and going to school. We still have struggle in the world to have elementary education for, for young kids not to talk about going to colleges and postgraduate schools. So affordable education for all is a must. How is it going to be achieved? I think it's to distribution of the wealth because as you all realize, we have a lot of people who have plenty and a lot of people who have nothing. And I think we have to work very hard in order to educate at least young generations to make a better world than we have today. Uh, digital divide has been a problem for a long time. And especially now when we are moving into everything digital, we are moving from in-person meetings to Zoom meetings on 24 uh, or, or WebEx. Uh, this digital divide is becoming very, very obvious. And I'm not even talking about the worldwide, I'm talking even locally within my community where I have students who say, well, I really cannot turn on the video because I don't have enough bandwidth. I don't have a plan that's going to allow me to, to, to have the video connection and to, to follow the classes. 
uh, moving the education online, it's a big uh, uh, challenge and it's a big theme for discussion these days because many universities are deciding to continue with online education and that that really has to bring appropriate technologies uh, and means in order to continue with online education. And I believe some of the online education is going to be here to stay. And it has pluses and minuses. And a big plus is that online, we should be all equal. Um, so in online education, that education will be available to many people across the world, not only locally who uh, enroll at the universities. So I was also looking at the World University Consortium and looking at the conferences there, and I thought that was a nice, nice way, nice platform in order to explore. Uh, let me just address the issue of digital divide, and I think my colleague, Dr. Smith, is going to talk tomorrow a little bit more about that. But uh, um, the, the, the access to internet is not ubiquitous. Uh, for example, in April of 2020, uh, almost 4.57 billion people were active internet users. That's 59% of the global population. And the statistics are quite current. And in June of this year, uh, 3.5 billion people or 45% have smartphones, 4.78 billion people or 61% have mobile phones. But we are not talking about 100%. So there are a lot of people who are left behind and who are left outside of this circle of community that can be connected to internet. And uh, Rodolfo, I'm very glad you mentioned the conference uh, in uh, Toronto. Uh, I hope that uh, we all see you in person in October. Uh, mm -hmm. The conference, uh, just I think there was a question about some deadlines on the question and answer period, uh, 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 chat. Uh, the deadline is June uh, 30th for some late papers, so there is still time to submit to System Many Cybernetics Conference uh, 2020. It's going to be held in Toronto. So we're all looking forward to your submissions. The deadline is uh, two weeks from now, so there's still time to submit the papers. Uh, it's, uh, the conference has been ongoing on for a long time. And that brings me to IEEE and to issue of uh, involving uh, young professionals and uh, students. Uh, it's an organization that has very much catered to uh, younger people, giving, giving them opportunities to collaborate and to participate in various governing bodies of the institution, uh, usually sitting on the board of governors. So it's a nice opportunity to involve younger professionals into such a large organization that has over 430,000 people worldwide. Uh, so that's all that I have to say. Thank you, Liliana. Yeah, you just uh, put on the, on the stage uh, an important issue that uh, pandemics just, just amplified, you know, that, that, uh, that we have to deal uh, not only with digital divide and many other problems, but we, even with connection divide. And, uh, and so, uh, that's that's something basic, uh, like uh, like uh, water, like uh, uh, electricity. Uh, we uh, today we need uh, connectivity, all over the nation, all over the world. That's that's uh, that's a need for everybody, just to to be equal. And now we go to the last, of, but not the least, uh, as as usually said. Uh, but uh, panelist that is uh, Robert. Robert, uh, Robert, please. The stage is yours. Amut yourself, please. Yes, I, I got it. Well, you you gave me the benefit of the doubt. I, I may be the least, to tell you the truth, but I'll I'm going to take my uh, my sweet <laughs> pitch. <laughs> um, and I should share with you. I can't. All of my uh, uh, little squares here are blacked out. I see myself, which is a little unsettling but I don't see any of you. So if, you're, if your body language is telling me anything about, um, about how this is all gonna be perceived, you'll have to, you'll have to say something. Um, I, I think I'd start, and I'm gonna say a few things that are overstated, but it's just in order to get the, the point out with a lot of, without a lot of nuances. Um, I think it would be useful to, to start by recalling uh, how far science is responsible for the problems that we're now trying to solve. Um, it might not be going too far to say 
except for what's been caused by human emotions. Science did the rest of it. Science at a high level and then science applied through technology. Um, and one wonders if that could have anything to do with something not just about science's instrumental character, but um, about something intrinsic to science. Now, early on, it was mentioned that we were trying to move away from the Newtonian system to another approach. And I, one thing that strikes me about the Newtonian system that one would have to attend to in order to move away from it is that that whole generation of thinkers sort of homogenized what it meant to be a human being. Human beings were matter in motion, just like the rest of nature. Um, and I, I wonder if that's not got something to do with how we created a world in which human beings seem to fit now so awkwardly. Um, one thing that I think noteworthy about that world is that the sciences and the humanities are in a state of virtual mutual misunderstanding on a regular basis. I, I'm not sure I can tell you a single time I've seen that not happen when the two communities come together to discuss things. Uh, and so I asked myself, what could be a point of departure that would that could, that could get us out of this ditch if, if I'm right in describing it that way? One thing that eventually science ended up teaching us with a fair amount of certainty was how uncertain were the fundamentals of nature. So if one moves from a Newtonian system where the fundamentals are reasonably certain to subsequent paradigms where they're not so certain, one might draw out of that something about the human condition that was relevant to those two bodies of thinking, being able to talk to one another. The other, uh, the other piece, I think, would be the human life. Somebody mentioned here today, we can't know the future. Human life is in a heck of a lot less uncertain than, uh, than the fundamentals of particle physics. The future is opaque, and that means concretely that a lot of the outcomes we'll get from whatever decisions we make about what to do are also opaque. That's why we have all, you know, every generation complains about the unintended consequences of whatever the prior generation did. Um, so uncertainty in the, in the larger whole and in our world seems to be a common foundation between the two. And the other thing worth mentioning, if you, you know, if you've got certainty at the bottom of things, you can have knowledge in a much more rigorous way than if you can't, than if, than if it's uncertain. Um, and in the absence of knowledge, at least in human affairs, you're mainly left with judgment. And that's, that's a way of thinking and reflecting and deciding that, that deals with ambiguities and uncertainties and deals with them on a regular basis and is conscious of them as such. So you start to wonder, could there be something in what we mean by both the larger whole and what we mean by the human whole that would that would be, could begin a dialogue between the sciences and the humanities that could prompt uh, or cultivate judgment now when you think about at least the human side of that those those um, uncertainties have to do with a whole bunch of things we all know pretty well starting with things like mortality and a whole host of then other limits that fall out from that. It also, though, is connected back to that Newtonian problem. So much of the ambiguity in human life comes from the fact that we're not homogenized, that, I mean, you, we can learn more about the diversity of human beings from Shakespeare or by reading the ordinary newspaper than we can get from thinking about human beings as a part of a large mechanism. So I think where I would end up is something like this. Insofar as the world we live in is a scientific world, 
I don't think you can solve these problems very well unless you can cultivate within the sciences a new sensibility to the humanities. I think that's very unlikely because the sciences by and large are people composed of people um, with, um, with a passion for knowledge that might not be uh, satisfiable by the humanities. And judgment might seem a, um, a kind of a poor halfway house. But I don't see, I, my own view of the world is we won't get these problems solved unless we can cultivate that judgment and cultivate it within the scientific community as a mark of science as a profession. And I think I'll stop there for now. Oh, um, I th let, me, let me not stop there. End of that paragraph. The other paragraph would be something like this, much simpler. Um, if one is trying to change a society, be it a small one or a global one, I would just make the suggestion that that change cannot arise except from within that society. So there would be a value in being able to find people within that society who are already going down the road that one wants to go down and find ways to cultivate them. And that might be at the level of the professions, which if thought through would bring us back to the sciences and the grassroots, which is a different problem altogether, which I'd love to discuss, but I won't, I won't go on about it for right now. Let me stop there. Thank you, Robert. I think that uh, each one of you put on the table uh, just the uh, uh, topics that uh, we require 10 conferences to, to, to discuss uh, in, a, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a fair way. And, uh, but the point is that uh, um, uh, now we have uh, about 10 minutes for our comments and uh, um, and so uh, I start with ladies first uh, and uh, and then uh, just uh, we have time for just a, a, a short round of, of comments on, on what you heard just on this panel so you, you like to start Carol or you Liliana which which one are you Liliana, bye. Liliana, go. Uh, well, I learned a lot from the panel uh, with different uh, views and different approaches. And I like very much this connection between humanity and technology. I think that's very important. In engineering, we talk about communication, but I think this is much broader. And if we bring humanity into everything we do, I think we might be able to resolve a lot of problems that we face today. Thank you. Carol. Thank you. And I would wrap with the idea that the more uh, diverse and uncommon collaborators we have, whether it's arts and humanities with technology or it's getting more young people to the table with people like us so we can learn from them and co-create with them, that diversity of all ways you can define it is how the innovation and the solutions are going to happen for humanity and for the emerging leaders who are all 15 years of age and under. So looking forward to working with all of you and um, your communities to, to achieve those things with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I, I go to uh, now to, to Whittle because he has to manage the next session. So I think that uh, he needs uh, a, a, a just a little priority. Thank uh, you very much. Please, Thank go. you very much. Uh, it's again pleasure meeting you all, seeing the, uh, everybody's views. I think we are on it together. And this, this conference will probably move all of us into more action. Uh, some of the, of the people on, on, on the chat indicated that we forgot arts in STEM. Uh, no, STEM is no longer STEM, it's STEAM, where arts are a part of it, and it is already has been integrated and practiced. The other person on questions asked about, we forgot about the indigenous people. We haven't. Uh, uh, Liana knows that Canada is doing a lot. Uh, there is a beautiful person called Verna Kirkness, uh, she for whom money meant nothing ever, and she got millions of dollars, established uh, a foundation that helps indigenous. We started 12 years ago, we started with four people. Last year, we had 148 people in Verna Kirkness, Kirkness Research Discovery Week for those who are interested. We uh, think about all, so when we say in, uh, others, 
uh, we don't forget indigenous. All of us are in the same pot. We are on the same, in the same boat. Any of us out of those billions and thousands that Liliana mentioned that lose their lives because of us, there are many of us who will preserve those lives. I'm still extremely hope, hopeful that by looking at the global, the integrated approach where machines exist, but humans do too. <laughs> and then by seeing all of us helping one another, hopefully there will be. So although I said, we don't know the future, we know the future in, in the terminology of Arudolfo to a horizon of predictability. I hope that this conference will help us in expanding the understanding of the horizon of predictability and also how we can shape that process and expand that horizon beyond what is necessary. Thank you very much. Thank you, Widow. And uh, Nebosha, you would like to add uh, your comment, please? Just a very brief comment. I love science and I enjoy science. I love and enjoy technology and the same is true for art. I see a necessity to connect and combine the fields, but I do not see a necessity to make a hold of all that. I think it would be impossible. Let me enjoy them separately, combine where it is possible and interesting. Let us not insist on making a whole. I think it's impossible. These are complementary things. Let me enjoy them separately. <laughs> okay, that's your point. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Nemosha. Robert. I just wanted to oppose a bit to the other, yeah, just yes, stimulate please. <laughs> the responses. Robert, please. Are you there? Hello? Yeah. Okay, I, uh, I, I think I'll just rejoin on that last one. Given the fact that science is a human enterprise, I'm not clear that one could understand either of the arts or the humanities on the one hand or the sciences on the other without somehow coming to terms with their common origin. And, and neither, neither convinced that we can solve these problems that we're talking about without coming to terms with that common origin. Um, so I, and I think I'll just stop there. What? Hello? Yeah, you can, you, can you still hear yeah, me? I, yeah, said, I think, I think I'll, I'll, that'll be my conclusion for, for this panel, for the day. Oh, okay. Okay, so I, I think just to sum up everything, uh, 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 taking consideration all your points, my, my my distillation uh, 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 goes in this, in this way. We have to learn to distinguish a, a approximated approximations from exact approximations. Currently, machines are dealing with approximated approximations and human beings are dealing with exact approximations. That's a fundamental diversity that uh, gives space to creativity for the human being. Uh, I, this, I mean, I like, I like to, uh, to be provocative, you know, <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> something that uh, I suggest you to think about that because uh, I, invite, I invite you all to attend uh, tomorrow's session. Tomorrow's session will, will be the, the, the third and last session on science, uh, engineering and technology. And I think it will be quite interesting to, to see the, the, the final uh, results uh, of our interactions. And, uh, and so with this, uh, I, I just uh, invite you to, to be present on this, uh, on this conference uh, till tomorrow, at least if you have no, no more interest in that, but uh, I suggest you to attend all other, other many, there are many, many interesting sessions and then, uh, and uh, I think that uh, again is a never-ending story. Uh, it, this is continuous learning. That is continuous learning, and and I suggest you, if you don't know uh, yet, the, a, a wonderful book uh, from Mary Catherine Bateson on active wisdom. 
active wisdom will tell you something really very interesting how we can change uh, we can transform society using untapped resources till yesterday And so I think that uh, we can, we can uh, conclude this session. I thank you all for, for uh, your interventions and uh, for the richness of the topics that you put on the table. And, and, and really, uh, each one of them would have deserved a, a full conference to, to be studied uh, uh, just uh, no, I, I don't I don't say correctly I just say just to understand better all the the major components that that uh, are interacting with that so thank you for your participation and hopefully see you on the next sessions thank you bye bye thank you all bye bye bye, -bye. bye, -bye. thank you very much thanks Thank you, Rodolfo. We will close the meeting now. I just copying the you know the all the messages. Okay, they will all be saved. The meeting is still live. All the messages, the questions will be saved. Janani, I I I send you my email.